chapter 11, uh, Genesis chapter 13, I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 13, verse number 11, that's, that's where we left. I want you to back up to what we were talking about last week uh, in verse 10, or, or verse 9. Uh, let's back up to 8. Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are brothers. And then in verse 9, he said, Is the whole is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. Uh, then I'll... And then verse 10, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the valley of Jordan that is well watered everywhere. And this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zor. So Lot chose for himself, and that's where we are in verse 11. Uh, so I want you to think about something. I mean, back then, you, you always went to the elder person, and the elder person got his choice of, of land. And here Abram is the leader, and, and he is the elder and he should have had the choice of what land he wanted, but he gave Lot his choice. And in your mind, you see Lot looking out. He's on top of a hill in, uh, in, in uh, Judea. And he's on top of that hill, and he's looking out, and he can see the plain down below, and it's well watered and all this grass, and he's got all his herds and, and all the things that he benefited, by the way, by being with Abraham. And so he looks and he observes and he, he takes his choice. We're going to talk more about that in just a few minutes. Um, what strikes you is this is what Sodom and Gomorrah, the plain, looked like before God destroyed everything. It was green. It was well watered. It was, it was beautiful, like the garden of God. And not today it isn't. Not today. So beginning in verse 11, let's read 11 through 13. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. Now I'm going to stop there. Uh, Lot chose the valley of the Jordan. It's beautiful. It's fertile. Uh, I wonder if greed might have taken him over when he looked and he saw that. He's getting his choice, old oh boy. And he sees the choice land. Uh, I, I think a lot of times when I see this, and it probably has nothing to do with it, but... Oh, by the way, these handouts I gave you is on Melchizedek and Jesus. And we, well, I don't know if we're going to make it that far. So next week we'll use that again, so be sure and save that. We'll talk all about Melchizedek. Like I say, this may, it may not be anything like I'm thinking, but when I, my dad's place was up on the hill, lots of rocks. And one of the job for us boys is to pick all them rocks up. And we'd pick all those rocks up and we'd go to where the corner post was, was and we'd start piling them rocks off. And before you know it, every corner post had rocks about that high. And, and that's what I'm thinking. He's, he didn't want to have nothing to do with those rocks. And he looks and he sees the valley below. It's well watered and green and wonderful. I, I don't know if greed took him over. I don't, I don't have any idea. And I don't know his heart. But I want you to notice something here. There's really two things to think over. The first one, he didn't weigh the bad part. And maybe that's a message for us that, that we don't look at the circumstances. Sodom and Gomorrah was always bad. It was always full of sin. You just saw right there. He settled in the land of Canaan, in the valley. And these Sodom was wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. It, it was a terrible place to live. Maybe he didn't consider that in his decision. And then second, in their society, it was common to defer to one's elder, which, one's older, which would have been Abram, and he didn't. He didn't ask, oh, by the way, he didn't even ask Abram for his advice. Where do you think I need to go? That's probably what we would say. 
Well, how about this? What do you think about this, Abram? But he didn't ask any of that. Lot's going to learn his lesson the hard way. He moved his tent toward Sodom. Before long, he moves into town. His family is subjected to all of that wickedness. It cost him dearly to leave there, but with the angels taking him. It also seems like Lot in, entirely missed the fact that he had been blessed because of Abraham because he was in the presence of Abraham. He was around Abraham all the time. Uh, to me, it almost seems like he lifted his eyes and he felt himself entitled to that. <laughs> I'm entitled. I want that. That's the area I want. And the reason I say that, it reminds us of someone's attitude today that we know. We, we, they're, they're felt entitled to everything, and they're not entitled to everything. <laughs> but they think they are. If you don't believe me, turn on the TV and just watch any news you want to watch, and it's full of people with entitlement. Um, verse 11, So Lot chose for himself the valley of Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated from each other. And this is what God wanted. He wanted Abram to go away from his family and away from his father's house and all that, and now he is. So Lot went to the eastern side of the mountains, the plain of Jordan, and Abraham stayed in the mountains of the land of Canaan. Uh, Lot gravitated toward Sodom. I, I, so many in life gravitate toward evil. Now, I don't know if he did. I don't think he did, but, but it goes on today. I'll say it that way. Sodom already had a reputation of being a terrible place. It, it was a terrible place all the way to the end. This is the great lesson here for us, I guess, that those, the, those of us men and women who are, are quickly get worse spiritually because they surround themselves with evil and wickedness. Is, is, am I right or wrong? I, what do you think? When you put yourself in that environment, that is not a good thing. And we see here the mention of Sodom about their wickedness is emphasized. So we see it's a, a foolishness on Lot, to, and, and, and the choice cost him dearly. The poor choices we make in this life cost us dearly sometimes. I, I want you to look, look at Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter two verse seven and eight. Second Peter chapter two verse seven and eight. And if he rescued righteous Lot, see, so so first thing we see is Lot is what? He's righteous. He's a follower of God. He's a righteous man, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. For by what he saw and heard, that righteous man living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day by day, a day after day, by their lawless deeds. That's something to think about, isn't it? His soul was tortured. He knew where he was and what was going on around him and his surroundings, and he has daughters and he has a wife. And but what does he do? He may have been a tortured soul, but what does he do? He stayed there, didn't he? He didn't have to stay there, but he did. It's a choice he made. So let's go to fourteen through eighteen. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so, if that, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise and walk about in the land through its length and its breadth, for I'll give it to you. 
the neighbor moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Remember, you can trace the route that Abraham took from Urichaldes all the way to where he is now by the altars that he built and worshiped God. Uh, a great lesson. Uh, so after a lot separated from him in verse 14, it's, it's interesting, after a lot left, now God is speaking to him because here Abraham finally obeys God completely. He doesn't have anybody but his immediate family. And that's what God told him to do. Uh, he told him to separate from your family and your father's house. And it was a command of God to leave his father's house. And now uh, God renews his promise to Abraham. Now that he is ready to go, he is fully cooperated. He has fully done the part he needed to do. Now God is going to bless him again. He's going to tell him again. I, I, I know this sounds silly, but I can put myself in the place of Abram. Can you? Can you put yourself in the place of Abraham? And God tells you to lift up your eyes and look northward and southward and eastward and westward. I can. I can see him doing that. God's telling him to do that. It reminds you when Moses got to see the promised land, he didn't get to go there, but God took him there so he could, up on the mountain, was it Nebo? Nebo, wasn't it? So he could look over and see the promised land that he'd been leading his people for 40 years, but he didn't get to go because of disobedience to God, but God showed him that land. So here God's telling Abraham, what did I say, Abraham? I meant Moses a while ago. Yeah, there, there, thank you for noticing that. I, I just now noticed it myself. Um, so he tells Abraham, lift up your eyes. I can see him lifting up his eyes. Darwin, he's looking east and west, north and south. It's all yours. It's all yours. In verse 15, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. It's important, I think, to understand and and. Darwin had a class Wednesday night where he talked about conditional promises of God and unconditional promises of God. Do you remember? Last, the other night, Wednesday night, he said, give me a conditional promise. And somebody said, the rainbow. I mean, an unconditional promise. That's an unconditional promise from God, the rainbow. What's it mean? He promises it never again to flood the earth and destroy the earth by a flood. And so that's a that's an unconditional promise. But here, it's this is going to be a conditional promise. Every promise of God is is that He's making is contingent upon His conditions that God sets out in His promise. As long as Israel, His descendants, were faithful to God, then they would possess the land. But if they were not faithful to God, what would happen? It would be taken away from you. Verse 16, I'll make your descendants as the dust of the earth. God promised to make his descendants innumerable, innumerable, unable to count them. Uh, I, I always think about when, when these promises started, when Abram, or when I don't know what is the matter with me. When Moses was in Egypt and he got the people out of Egypt, the, the number that came to Egypt of, the, of Jacob's family was about 75 or 76. I can't remember the exact number. About 75 or 76 people came to Egypt because Joseph brought Jacob and, and the other children. You know how many they had when they left Egypt? Two million, about, about two million. So this promise to Abraham is being made to him. Your descendants are going to be like the stars of the sky, the sand on the seashore. But 
what is it about that promise that may be shocking to Abraham? He, he's old. He doesn't have any children. He's old. But the amazing thing is, God keeps his promise, doesn't he? And he does. Even though Sarah goes in the tent and she can hear him, and the angel said, you're going to have a son by the time you come back next year. And what does she do? <laughs> she, she, she tries to cover up her laugh in the tent. Why did you laugh? I didn't laugh. Oh, I didn't laugh. <laughs> uh, so, so he has no child, but God keeps his promise. And Christians are descendants of Abraham too. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. Listen, God keeps his promises with us too, doesn't he? Doesn't he? What's he promised us? Why are we faithful to him? Eternal life in heaven. Listen, that makes me want to get out of this chair, I tell you, because listen, oh, what a promise. Eternal life with him, heaven. If we'll just be faithful, that's not much. Just be faithful. That's what he wants Abraham to do. Just be faithful. Just obey me. And that's what we're to do. Verse 17. I'm, again, I'm using my imagination. It's easy for me. Arise and walk about the land through its length and its breadth. For I'll give it to you, he says. Abraham, being a man of faith in God, he walked through the land of promise that's going to be his descendants' land. He did as God commanded him to do. Walk the breath, the length. I'm going to give this to you. In verse 18, Then Abraham moved his tent and came and dwelt in the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Abraham kept walking the land. He found a place he decided to settle, and he took it. Reminds me of Jim and Marcia. They went out to look at this place. They loved it. And anybody who goes out to their house today, they love it. Beautiful. And that's what Abraham saw. That's what he wanted. Or you go to Todd and Liz, and you walk out there and you see, you have to be careful backing up out of his driveway or you go off a cliff. But, but he's careful. He watches you and helps you. Or Darwin, you walk out of his garden. You see his garden. It may take him a week to mow his grass, but he gets it done. <laughs> So Abraham kept walking. He found a place he decided, this is where I want, by the oaks. Uh, King James says, terebent tree. Uh, the terebent tree, it grew to uh, like 20 feet high. It had a reddish and green leaves, it, red berries clusters on it. Sometimes the other versions translate it as uh, teal or elm or oak. It's beside the tree he liked. <laughs> There's trees there. I, I like the oaks of the terebinth trees. You see all the oak trees, which is in Hebron. Hebron is about two miles away, uh, 19 miles southwest of Jerusalem. It stood on a landscape. Uh, 3,000 feet above sea level. It was here that Abraham built that altar. He made a sacrifice to God and he worshiped God. You ready for 14? I don't know how far we're going to get. We'll probably only get right to Mekil, Mekil, Mel, 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 Melchizedek. <laughs> Boy, that'll make your tongue run away with. <laughs> and then we'll talk about him next Sunday probably. So, anybody have anything you want to add that, that, that was said so far? Listen, this morning, I'm in my lesson, I want you to watch me. I want you to listen carefully. I want to know 
how far off I am. <laughs> if I say something wrong this morning, because uh, for me, it, it's tough what, what I'm going to talk about, and it's all kinds of scripture in there, and I'm not going to give you time to look at all of those so you, you have it in your outline. Where you need to start, stay is in Second Thessalonians chapter two. You can't go wrong by doing that. But I, I want you to watch me, and watch what I say. I want you to watch me what I, what I say here in class. I don't ever want to say anything wrong. So you watch me. So Genesis chapter fourteen: Abraham and the war with the kings. I'm going to struggle through verses one through three, and because of my lack of pronunciation, you've got to be patient with me. <laughs> it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ar Arioch, king of Elaser, and this Carolomer, and I'm going to stop. I I'm going to just tell you, let's talk about it. Besides my lack of pronunciation, these are marauding kings, and they're identified by name and territory. And it wasn't a vast territory. It, it wasn't large armies, uh, but they were um, uh, kind of uh, minor kings. And they put them all together, and they made them a small army. And uh, Shinar is an area of Babylon. And Elam is a region east of Babylon, and the rest of the areas, nobody knows where they are. And this Carolomer is a leader of these forces. He's a leader of these armies. Uh, Tidal, the king, uh, Goam means nations. So if I can make this where you can, where I can understand it, hopefully, you, you probably know a lot better than I do, but in verse 2, he's just identified the kings and their territories that were attacked by the kings in verse 1. So the main thing to notice here is Bera is the king of Sodom, and Bersha is the king of Gomorrah. And in verse 3, we're given the location of the battle. It's in the valley of Siddim, or the Salt Sea. It was located in a plain, in a valley. It could have been near Sodom and Gomorrah, because archaeologists, when they dug in the Sodom and Gomorrah area, it shows two destructions that they've been able to uncover, archaeologists. One is this battle. It's this battle here that we're fixing to look at, where Abraham rescues Lot. And the second is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities of the plain. Now, verses 4 through 9. We're told in, verse, in, in these verses, for 12 years these kings, they served this Carolomer, but they rebelled. And you see both sides. So the kings who rebelled conquered all the areas that, that we're looking at here. The king of Sodom and his kings, verse 8 and 9, and the four kings of Sodom are going to do battle against five kings. Does that make, that make sense? The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham, five, four kings and their nations, small nations. They're not big nations are going to do battle against five kings and their nations who's trying to conquer them. <sighs> Verse 10. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hill country, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and their food and all their food supply and departed. And they also took Lot, Abraham's nephew, and his possessions and departed. For he was living in Sodom. Uh-huh. And he became a victim. 
because he lived there, these five kings and their small nations took all this over, took everything they had against these four kings. So the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, they fled. They took their armies and they went and they made a mistake. They went into the where the tar pits were. And you know the archaeologist today knows where those tar pits are. And so they took their armies and they fled into these tar pits and, and the survivors of that <laughs> went to the hill country. And the tar pits were not good terrain if you were an attacking soldier and he lost a lot of soldiers. They lost a lot of soldiers here. So this king, verse 11, the king's under Carolomer, he's the bad one, defeated the four armies, which included Sodom and Gomorrah. Everybody with me? Have I totally confused anybody? There's four kings against five kings. There's Sodom and Gomorrah, and those four kings, and then he's got these five kings who's, in, who's the lead of it is at Carolomer, verse 11. He defeated those four armies. They plundered the city including Lot. They took Lot, they took everything Lot had, which means they took all of his herds and his, all of his family and everything. Now we're going to rescue Lot. Verses 13 through 16. Let's rescue Lot. Then a fugitive came, and he was a, he was a, he was a prisoner, and he escaped. Then a fugitive came, and told Abram, the Hebrew, now he was living in the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, brother of Abner, and these were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, that's how many soldiers he's got, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them as far as this Hobah, Hobah, which is north of Damascus, and he brought back all the goods, and he also brought back his relative Lot with all his possessions and also the women and the people. Now, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to notice one thing, verse 13. You see the word Hebrew there? Then a fugitive came and told Abram, the Hebrew. You might make a note of this. This is the first time Hebrew is used in the Bible. Hebrew means, by the way, Hebrew means beyond the river. You know what river they're talking about? Is the Euphrates River. They came beyond the river. That's where Abraham came from. He crossed the Euphrates came into this area. So this is an accurate description of Abraham's origin. They called him a Hebrew, which meant beyond the river. Uh, the river being the Euphrates. It's an accurate description of Abraham's origin. So Abraham had some allies, and were, and we're not told how many are fighting uh, of the men of these other three people, Mamre and Eshcol and Ab Aner. But verse 14, when Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, he gets his trained men. I got to go get Lot. I got to go rescue Lot. He had 318 men when he did. And so in verse 15, he divided his forces by night and his servants, and defeated them, all those five armies, all those five kings. He defeated them, and pursued them, and chased them as far as Hobath, which is north of Damascus. So Abraham defeated those five kings. When he caught up to them, he divided the men up. He attacked them at night. The enemy had no idea he was coming. And so in my mind, I see a celebration taking place. He just conquered five nations and five kings, and he brought back all the goods of Lot, everything he had, his possessions, his, the women, the people, a small army, dedicated and focused, determined to fight. 
a larger force with simple and effective battle plan. So that's what happened. And to me, it's interesting to see this. The character of Abraham was made known when he learned from his uh, trip to Egypt. He grew in faith and character, and his rescue was so efficient. He got everything back. He didn't lose nothing. And it shows us that God was with him. Yes, sir. It chased him a long way. Uh, God was with him. And it's just what I figured. We will not go to Melchizedek, but I've given you a sheet that you'll be able to study on your own. And verse 17 will be there next week. And we were going to talk all about Melchizedek and Jesus Christ. And I want you to watch me next week. I don't want you to see me get carried away. <laughs>